I'm very excited to be up here with uh, three folks, three gentlemen who uh, they they get their they get their hands dirty. They're they're folks who've been uh, they've been farming uh, I guess pretty much your whole lives so for for at least two of you. And um, so I have to to my immediate left I have uh, Martin Kleinschmidt. Uh, he's retired, sustainable agricultural specialist. Uh, used to be with the Center for Rural Af Rural Affairs. And um, he owns and manages a 380-acre uh, grass and grain farm uh, in northeastern Nebraska. Right. And to his left, we have uh, Jeff Moyer, uh, farm director at the Rodale Institute for about the past 30 years. And uh, he helps farmers transition to uh, sustainable uh, agriculture. Uh, he's also the former chair of the National Organic Standards Board and a uh, founding board member of Pennsylvania Certified Organic, author of the book Organic No-Till Farming. And to his left, we have Johannes Lehman, uh, associate professor in the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences at Cornell University. And he studies biochar, which is, I learned last night, a rebranded term for uh, charcoal, but charcoal used in a very specific way. So I'm going to start with um, Martin to my left here. Uh, at, at dinner last night, uh, Martin told me a very interesting sto uh, story that sounded to my ears almost biblical. It was a story about turning uh, sand into soil in a certain patch of land in Nebraska. Okay. And uh, it, it intrigued me because it was, uh, it was a technique uh, uh, that I had never heard about um, to keep the, to, to uh, basically produce healthy soil uh, in a way that, um, that is new. The, the, the term is mob grazing, and when I first saw that term, I got this image of uh, busloads of tourists descending, <laughs> descending on the Philip Seafood Buffet here in town. But it's something totally different. A little bit different. Yes, Brian, we, this is a, I, the, the field I was talking about is a patch of ground about 4,000 acres along the Platte River in Nebraska. And if anybody knows about the Platte, it's what we call a braided river. There's a lots of sand in it. And I heard about this project for many years and know the people involved. And so. We looked at it when it first started. This is a piece of ground that was growing up with nothing but weeds, and thank God there were thistles. Thistles are considered awful weeds, but they will grow when there's no organic matter, and so they cover the soil, and it's, and it's, it's obviously needed. So this ground was taken over by uh, uh, the, the power company there, and there was pressure to not use any chemicals on this, but of course get rid of the the weeds and make it a habitat for wildlife because the wildlife people had something to say in that as well. And so a friend of mine, Chad Peterson, introduced goats to the system, 600 goats, I think it was, or 1,200 goats. And they came there for two years and they ate thistles and they ate the brush and they ate the cedar trees because that's what goats like to do. Then he, he followed that with four years of cattle grazing. And these were not baby calves, these were, these were yearlings normally you go to the feed yard at the age of 12 months. Well, in this case, they went back to grass at 12 months. So we didn't bring any corn into this. And the cattle came and they grazed for four years, uh, each year a different set of cattle, of course. And so the day I was there was that, that sixth year, the sixth anniversary of this. And I'm introduced to this lush prairie with lots of grass, thick grass, and it walks soft. And then I stepped across the electric fence, which is what, what Chad used to control the animals. And um, there was, I spread the, the weeds, it was some broad leaves, and I spread them and I looked down and I saw grass, gravel, sand, and pretty coarse sand, something that wouldn't support very much life. And again, all there was was these few broad leaf weeds. Then I stepped over the electric fence again, and I looked down and all I saw was grass, thick, thick like you would have on your lawn. And so I reached down to start digging in this grass, and I found litter, which is half decomposed grass, and about a half inch to three eighths inch thick. And this is kind of an insulator thing. It, it catches water and it keeps the ground cool. And I went a little further and I found what I would have to say is a quarter inch of soil, black soil. And it was crumbly and it was just what I want on my farm in Nebraska. And I don't have that much sand. So this was really an experience. And below that black soil was the same sand that was on the other side of the fence. So what did we have here? We had a system, and again, this is a system. I hate when people take things out of the system and try to analyze them. But this was a system where we brought livestock in. They took the weeds and they took the, the grass and converted it into something that the soil biology could use. And the soil biology then took the carbon that was in this, created by the sun in, into the, you know, the vegetation, and turned it into a stable form of carbon 
that hay grows more grass, which feeds cattle, which is food for us. What a great system. <laughs> so this is the system that, that we kind of put on our farm too. We don't quite use it as, as, as intensively as Chad did, but the important part, thing about the high density, high stock density program to mob grazing is that we have a lot of animal impact. We want a million pounds of animals per acre for a short period of time, only for a short period of time, in order to get the animal impact. This is the same impact that hit our, that our prairies experienced before we got here. You know, the Indians knew how this all worked and, and let it happen. And we came and took the animals off because we had better uses for the land. So, but that's the, the resilience that Fred was talking about is in that, in that litter and in that stable organic matter. Because the litter keeps the ground cool we're going to need that. The litter also acts as a sponge to grab the moisture so it has a chance to soak in rather than run away. And we're growing grass or a vegetation that maybe we can't use so well, but the animals can, and then the animals turn that over and we can consume them and, and get fed. This is not for all areas, all, all acres, but it certainly, I think, needs to be part of the acres, especially those that, we don't, that, that are not suitable for farming that are marginal lands. So this is, this is what we're wanting to do on our farm. There's a, another organization called the Carbon Farmers of America, and there's a book out there called Priority One that I haven't heard anybody mention. I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I've read the book, or most of it, it's pretty thick. It's available online, and it talks about how we can take with the right management, and most of it includes this animal impact, we can actually capture all the excess carbon out of the atmosphere and put it back in the ground by the use of this method plus something called the key line method. And, and we can do that within 20 years. What an opportunity. I think we ought to look into that a little more. So, so do you know, has anybody tried to figure out, tried to calculate how much carbon uh, you can capture in, in an acre with this technique? Has, has anybody uh, run those numbers? Do you have any idea? Uh, it absolutely depends on your environment, on your climate, sure. but since uh, organic matter is about 58% carbon, mm -hmm. I'll let you do the math. Yeah. Whatever you can do, I mean, whatever we can do helps, so let's, let's do that. Great. There might be a better one. Some lands will do better than others, obviously. Right, right. So you're saying, yeah, this is a selective technique. Right. Well, in, in, this, in the southern climates where it's warmer, this is going to be a slow process because they lose so much. Every year we lose carbon. Uh, unless we keep replenishing it, we will lose it. So that's a, that's a natural function. It's always happened, and that's how it got in the air in the first place. So we have to maintain a system that keeps putting it back because losing it, you know, it's a dynamic. So we right. have to do that. Right. right. Great. Thank you. Um, I want to move now to uh, Johannes, who has... Uh, who's working on another technique to put carbon back <coughs> into the soil and to keep it there for a little longer. Um, Johannes uh, mentioned uh, to me last night that, that uh, biochar has become a, a very hot topic in agricultural research circles, that there's almost as many papers published about biochar our, now as there are about uh, composting science. And uh, it's uh, apparently the oldest um, agricultural technology, I guess, if you want to call it that. Uh, going back, what, thousands and thousands of years. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Ryan. I, I, uh, I want to preface uh, an answer to your, to your question by uh, um, being in a session with solutions um, is, always makes everybody feel uncomfortable um, because there is not one solution. Um, there may be not even a lot of solutions. There's a whole toolbox of, of uh, technologies that we unpack as needed. Um, and uh, so uh, we we'll just want to restate the obvious um, that, that there is no silver bullet, uh, that, but that there are uh, several technologies. And what, what biochar exemplifies at the moment um, is, uh, among many other good ideas that are coming up, um, that this is not the end of um, our ability to innovate farming. Uh, we, we, are, we can be creative, and I think we should be creative, um, in farming and we can learn from ancient farming systems um, and we can develop new ones and they're always appropriate for some locations and not appropriate for others um, and before we try it out we'll never know so back to back to biochar as a as an example for that um, that that has been 
uh, very prominent in the discussion um, starting five years ago. Uh, biochar is a, is a charcoal-like substance uh, created through uh, slow uh, heating under the, uh, under the exclusion of air, uh, which then transforms biomass into a charcoal um, uh, type substance that really fundamentally changes the chemistry of the material. Um, makes it much more durable in the environment. Um, so instead of a leaf that would decompose within weeks or months, uh, a charred leaf would decompose only within uh, decades, hundreds, or even thousands of years. Um, so th th that, that's a huge asset to boost uh, organic matter uh, in soils. Um, and it turns out that uh, these char-type substances in soils are much more efficient per unit surface area or mass than any other organic matter in retaining nutrients. Um, so there, there are a few uh, pointers here that we actually uh, most recently um, uh, uh, studied and, and uh, um, trying to copy from, from dark earths from the Amazon, so-called terra preta soils, that have been manipulated in that way, adding charcoal hundreds to thousands of years ago. Uh, and then abandoned, and they maintain their high fertility and high carbon content to this day. We now learn that this is actually not an anomaly or, or a speciality of the Amazon. We find it in Africa, we find it in Australia, we find it even in the Midwest and the prairies. Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, probably up to half of the carbon in, uh, in Midwestern soils, in fertile Midwestern soils, is char carbon from periodic burning um, before the arrival of the Europeans. The prairies were burned uh, almost annually. Um, so that's a, that's a remnant of that. So we, we find out that there's, there's actually uh, quite a bit um, of uh, legacy that we are capitalizing on now with, with our uh, bread baskets of the world. But, but similar to uh, Martin, I want to stress that you know, uh, beyond biochar being a material, it's very important um, to employ a systems view. Uh, because that otherwise, that could derail any, any type of innovation and any type of management. Uh, it depends on the location, it depends on what else you do, and that's, again, exemplified quite, quite uh, forcefully by, by something like biochar, which you always actually said biochar systems, right? because it's, it's more than a material. If you produce biochar uh, from the wrong feedstock or in the wrong way, then you might actually harm the environment more uh, than you benefit it. Um, but judiciously applied, um, it, there are opportunities, and the question is now how many opportunities there are uh, where you can produce biochar from a material that might otherwise be burned. Um, see, for instance, pine bark beetle kill uh, in British Columbia uh, or rice straw in China um, that then improves soils for the long term, mitigates climate change by burying carbon and reducing emissions from agricultural soils and possibly landfill material. Um, and generate energy at the same time because 70% of the energy is actually driven off during the char making process in form of gases and liquids that can be captured in modern uh, uh, energy systems called very often pyrolysis where we can uh, generate uh, liquid and, and gaseous fuels and electricity. Um, so packaged in that way, um, it, uh, it, it, it is a very appealing uh, and complex system uh, which I see as an advantage and the way that we have to deal with, um, with our rather complex agriculture and, uh, and uh, agroecosystems. Um, but it, it's very knowledge intensive uh, and, that, uh, and, and local knowledge intensive, which is, um, might pose an obstacle to judicious application uh, and adoption. Right. So, so you've uh, helped start a number of, of small projects, it sounds like. And I'm just curious if, uh, what, what the system looks like if, if somebody is trying to both make uh, biochar out of, out of a feedstock and capture, say, you know, gas that can be turned into, like you said, a low-grade diesel. What, what is the technology? What does the system look like? Um, it can have uh, a lot of different shapes. Um, there are projects that look at very small scale cook stove application, single household uh, in Africa, for instance. There are uh, dozens of projects now that look at, uh, at stove applications where uh, by switching from, from burning with wood, where the family and very often kids and women have to track for long 
times into, into the forest um, to hail out uh, wood, um, which in itself has a lot of environmental ramifications. Um, uh, switching from combustion burning to pyrolysis affords you the possibility also to switch your feedstock, whatever you burn. Now you can switch from, from uh, uh, wood to, for instance, rice husks, uh, leaves, grasses. Um, and, and, and that, that uh, 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 allows the opportunity for uh, uh, saving time, uh, saving money, um, and, um, and, and improving soils at the same time. Uh, up to larger systems, uh, there's a poultry farmer in West Virginia uh, who uses his poultry wastes uh, for heating the uh, chicken farm uh, houses and uh, offsets all his fossil fuel energy costs, um, as well as the, the, the energy used. Um, and mitigates an issue of adding phosphorus to agricultural land that then uh, uh, ends up in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, so that's, that's another level up. Um, another level up is um, uh, uh, county or, or um, uh, village scale systems uh, that might, or municipality systems that might uh, aid in, in managing uh, agricultural or household uh, or garden wastes. Mm -hmm. um, so they can range from simple clay stoves for just a few dollars to larger systems that um, cost a lot of money and uh, still need to be developed. On all scales, there's a lot of development that still needs to be done. Great, thank you. And, and we'll uh, t touch on some of the uh, barriers to implementation. I want, I want to come back to that maybe mm -hmm. in a minute. But first, I want to uh, get to Jeff, uh, who has a lot of experience helping farmers. Uh, you used a, an analogy that I guess is inflammatory in some cir circles, the, uh, the drug addiction analogy. Uh, I, I, I hope so. <laughs> you hope it's inflammatory, right. Um, you have a lot of experience in helping uh, farmers move to organic and, um, uh, and off of, of uh, chemical fertilizers. Uh, but, but there's a lot, it sounds like there's a lot of, of, of ins and outs in how you do it, and there's a transition period that can be uh, that can be more or less painful, I guess, depending on how you go about it. So, so explain how that transition, depending on what crops you're working on, how that transition can be, uh, can be made as, as smoothly as possible. Well, certainly before any farmer can enter a transition period, we first have to understand what we're trying to move away from and what we're trying to move towards. Uh, clearly, I think there's some consensus from the podium here, not complete, but some that we have certain issues with our current food production system that need to be uh, fixed. We have some, there's, there's some breakage there, some components that are broken. And unless, w unless a farmer can understand what's broken on his farm, it's very difficult to understand where you're going to go and how you're going to transition. Um, the, the real exciting part about what the work that we're doing at the Rodale Institute and my own personal work is that we do have solutions. The title of this topic was solutions to, to the system that's broken. There are some really exciting solutions out there. Of course, one of them is the work I do in, in organic uh, or certified organic farm production. And while there's components of that that are, as was mentioned from the podium earlier, uh, connected directly to a very rigid or somewhat rigid uh, federal standard, there's many of the principles that are involved that can be adopted and adapted across a large spectrum of, of agriculture. So it's when we start to look at those principles and move them from, uh, from the the uh, kind of the, the drawing board out onto the farm that we have to analyze each individual farm separately and look at what kind of mitigation strategies we can impose on the landscape to transition a farm without having any kind of downgrade or penalty to the yield. Now, yield is important, but it can't be the only indicator by which we judge the success of a farm. Uh, that's what got us into the trouble that we're in today with our broken uh, system. That being said, we're all aware that we have to produce food. When I took over uh, management of the farm that uh, the Rodeo Institute owns, and it, it's been quite a number of years now, close to, I guess it's about 36 years that I've been there, uh, Bob Rodeo, who owned the, the, the research station, was the, founder, uh, the son of the founder, said to me, your challenge is not simply to grow food. Yes, you have to produce food if you want to keep your job or someone else will be doing it. But while you're producing the food, you have to improve the health of the soil. Which means we're not, as, as uh, Fred just mentioned from the podium here, we're not going to be degrading the resource that we need to produce food. We have to build up the resource at the same time that we're producing food. And his uh, premise was that because food production should be based on a system and a science of biology, not merely chemistry or biotechnology, which are 
legitimate sciences, but so is biology. If we base our production strategy on biological principles, it's one of two, oh, it's two things. It's scale neutral, and we know it's going to work. So we can actually improve the health of the soil while we produce food at the same time. So it's that strategy that we use when we begin talking to farmers about transition. So to go from a conventional cornfield to an organic cornfield is not a simple leap of faith where you just start planting corn this year and you don't have anything in place to substitute for the chemicals, and that's where I use the drug addiction analogy, uh, you're going to run into trouble. So if we know that, we simply don't use that strategy. We'll move into other crops uh, like soybeans or some kind of forage crop, a hay crop. Uh, you can do it on vegetables, you can do it with livestock. There's many different strategies. But the idea is that you think and plan through the process to mitigate those problems. So, 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 so you're, there might be a drop off in production, you're saying, for, for a few years that, 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 that folks have to prepare for. No, what I'm saying is there's a there might be a drop off in production if you don't plan properly. If you plan properly and, and organize your transition, uh, according to biological principles, there is no drop-off. Yeah. So one, one of the themes that, that I'm hearing from all three of you is that there's a huge amount of specialized knowledge required for each of these techniques, that one of the barriers maybe here is just the knowledge. I mean, what you're talking about is, is it sounds like very specific for, for the, you know, the f field by field almost. Yeah, I mean, our, our premise is that farmers are going to have to learn a whole lot more about their farm and particularly a whole lot more about their soil. For most farmers that enter this kind of a process, that's a challenge they're up for and they're excited to, to step into that arena and, and learn. Uh, clearly, if we continue down the road that we're doing, you know, we talk about sustainability. On our particular farm, we have done some anthropological and archaeology studies with a local university looking at Native Americans that were managing land. They were burning using stone tools and fire to manage the landscape and plant food. They were doing that eight to 10,000 years ago. Anybody in this room who thinks we're going to be using Roundup in eight to 10,000 years is <laughs> foolish, at, at the very least. That kind of a system is not sustainable in the long term. So we would hope that people would be farming on our farm at Rodale, or my farm at home. I, I have my own farm at home. Uh, eight to 10,000 years from now. I have no idea what that system's going to look like. I do know that they're going to need the soil just like we do today and just like the Native Americans did. And if we don't take care of our soils, if we continue to farm them the way we're doing, uh, we're going to have trouble. A good example is uh, the idea of no-till soybeans, which we heard about again. Uh, the problem with no-till soybeans as it's practiced today uh, across most of the United States and much of the world is it grew up hand in glove with uh, synthetic herbicides. When you spray those herbicides, the intended result is that we can kill weeds. And that works. The problem is there's many unintended uh, results that happen as well. There's side effects. One of those side effects is we're killing off all the microbiology and the, micro the muscular mycorrhizal fungi. Now, you go, well, I can't see them. What's the, what's the difference? Well, that mycorrhizal fungi has a very important role to play in keeping our soils healthy and actually gluing the, the soil structure together so it doesn't wash away in the rain. Why are we losing so many tons of topsoil even in no-till systems? It's because we're killing the fungi. It's not an intended result of the herbicide, but it happens just the same. So if we really want to make some changes, we're going to have to look at fundamental philosophical differences in how we manage soil. Uh, um, I'm, I'm interested in hearing from all three of you about places in the world where there is interest in adopting these systems. Uh, Jeff, I know uh, you said that China is very, you've noticed an uptick in interest in ecological agriculture in, in China. Well, China, China, we've just finished a, uh, a report on 30 years of our work in our one farming systems trial where we've been able to document that uh, our yields over 30 years have been equal to, or in many cases, depending on weather patterns, and we're here to talk about weather patterns, uh, organic systems actually out yield conventional systems. What, what happens let, in let, let me just stop you. That seems like a very important point. Is that, I, I don't know if the general world knows that, if, if that's a point that's, that, that's made enough. Well, it, it's, there's new information coming out daily about that topic. It's not known well enough, partly because uh, there's very few organizations like the Rodale Institute that are publishing that kind of information, and there's a lot of dollars trying to not allow that to be heard widely. I mean, let's face it, people make money with the system the way it is. Right. 
and those people are not interested in hearing a different paradigm being projected. Now, we all realize that over time it's going to happen anyway. Uh, so when you look at China, yes, China's interested. Uh, we've been, had a lot of interest from Argentina. I was just in uh, Paris. Uh, the French government is very interested in these sorts of issues because they all realize that changes in the wind. We heard about the exciting changes that are happening with young people involved in getting involved in agriculture. How do we move more of those folks in? Fred or somebody talked about the age of farmers approaching 60. We know that's happening. Uh, I'm not 60 yet, but I'm getting closer. Uh, some, who's going to take over? We need to work on those things. So when you look at what's happening in other countries uh, or around this country, there's a huge upsurge in interest in, in transitioning, maybe not directly to a certified organic operation, but certainly to incorporate the kinds of principles and practices that we're talking about in organic. Uh, you know, and we as a society have to recognize that we, we incentivize farmers to farm in particular ways. I get incentives. Uh, Bob Rodale gave me some very strong incentives. I've got incentives on my farm at home. Uh, when I talk to my neighbor who farms 3,000 acres of corn, he doesn't see himself as a food producer. He's a farmer, but he doesn't produce food. He said, I produce corn and soybeans. Could be ink, could be ethanol, could be high fructose corn syrup. I don't know what it is. It's not food. It's a commodity. I get paid to produce as many tons of yellow stuff as I possibly can, as cheap as I can do it. I said, what about the soil? He goes, I don't get paid to manage the soil. Right. I get paid to grow tons and tons of yellow stuff. Well, as long as we as a society reward people for that, that's what you're going to get. Uh, if, on the other hand, we reward farmers or incentivize them to plant cover crops, it's, it's, it's an organic type principle. You don't have to be certified organic to plant cover crops. But if the landscape from Washington, D.C. to your farm in Nebraska was green instead of brown all winter, make a huge difference. Uh, we have the power to incentivize people to do that. We just don't. So I, I want to ask about that uh, in, in the context of biochar. Uh, last night you were telling me that there was a company that uh, maybe 10 years ago uh, had come up with a, a system that could be used maybe on the scale of a medium-sized city like Ithaca to turn some waste into biochar, but that uh, this system, you know, 10 years later, or however many years it is, it still has not been, been commercialized. Mm -hmm. what, yeah. Why is that? Um, it's it's more convenient to go the way we've gone and, and it requires quite a commitment um, to, to move that financial commitment, but especially commitment by innovators on the ground. Uh, where we see innovation is uh, less from big corporations that, that take this on, but uh, from uh, small and, and medium-sized farmers who see an opportunity on their land to make, to, to deal with a certain soil fertility constraint, uh, or uh, residue management constraint, uh, and they drive the innovation. Um, and, and they usually don't have the, the cash uh, to put a million dollars on the table to develop a technology if it's not already there. Right. Uh, we see now a lot of innovation, again, in China. Um, they had nothing in this area three, four years ago, and now most of the long-term field trials and most of the industrial scale or, or um, or, or uh, farm scale units are being developed in China. Um, within two or three years, they, they completely outstripped the rest of the world in, in, in development and, uh, of the technology. And I, I think we'll probably see that in, in many other areas as well. Mm -hmm. uh, one just, um, we have also on, on the, I, I think we all agree, soil carbon and soil organic matter is, is key. And, and, and this conundrum of, um, yes, we know that, uh, but the knowledge system is much more difficult than um, managing a new variety where you, know, you can scale it by here's a box, it has a new label on it, and you distribute it in the way that you distributed all your other boxes before, and that's very easy. Uh, but the, the, the knowledge system is, is so specialized um, to the farm and even the farm field uh, that, that it is much more difficult uh, to scale up. But I think now we need to recognize that uh, even with the best um, uh, GM uh, or otherwise bread crop, they still take up water and nutrients and they will in the future and they will still need a fertile soil. Uh, and the soil needs to serve all the other ecosystem services uh, beyond food production. Um, so I think we, we have to be creative um, in tackling this knowledge system uh, problem. Can you describe a few of your, your projects? I know you've been working in Africa. How, how are you trying to see that knowledge? And uh, I guess is it you know kind of farm by farm? Are there are, is there a way to try to spread the knowledge in, in a, in a, on a larger scale? 
Um, we, we need to start farm by farm because that's where, where the development uh, gets to a maturity where it actually can be spread more efficiently. Um, now, if, if, we, if we take an Ethiopian small-scale farmer, uh, we, we know very well that uh, to maintain soil fertility and soil carbon, we should leave the crop residue on. Um, everybody would agree, uh, but they can't because the cattle need to eat the crop residue. We know that the manure should go back in the soil to feed the plants and, and uh, maintain organic matter, but we can't, they can't. They have to use the manure to heat and to cook. Um, so we need to find uh, these, address these, these local issues which then might not be addressable by zero tillage or, or, or other uh, technologies, but um, they need to feed or, or take tools or ideas out of a big basket and reassemble them uh, for their needs and, and bring them to maturity um, that they can be more widely disseminated. Um, and then being cautious that that dissemination takes account of, of local conditions as well. So there's a lot of back and forth, and, and, and we see that with biochar, with no-till, uh, with, with all kinds of um, uh, projects uh, that uh, uh, I can give help in identifying the most likely type of biochar that addresses a significant soil fertility constraint at location X. Um, I can maybe also help um, identifying a technology to produce the biochar or uh, look at different feedstock options for that biochar. Uh, but to, to make that system work, we need to work with farmers uh, on, on their farm. And that, that just takes a while, and then we can grow out from there. I guess you, you need the idea to, uh, to go viral, I guess, right? And people yes. that, to, to share it with each other. So how about the, the mob grazing idea? How, is, is it, um, have you seen other, other farmers get interested in this? Is it, is it a very, very new idea? How, how widespread is it? Well, there's a, a growing demand for grass-finished beef. And so that's kind of pushing this. But it, it's no longer a niche market, but it is still a specialty market. So we need that market you know, to support this. But there's, there's a lot more that we could be doing. Right now we have this CRP program, which takes you know, land out of production for 10 years. And, and we know that as the grass so that's, grows, that's the federal program. it's the federal program. And as the grass grows, it gets thicker and thicker, and it becomes um, ill-suited for, for pheasants. And that's a big issue with, with the wildlife people. So the solution then is to burn it once every three years or so which certainly spurs the growth of warm season grasses, but it also burns off and kills all that, or evaporates all the carbon that has been grown up during those three years. Hmm. And so there may be a better way to do that, and that would be to introduce livestock to that in order to trample that, that grass down and, and, make it in, and bring it in contact with the soil. The bacteria do a great job of breaking down those minerals and all that, that uh, organic matter, but they have to have access to it, and they don't climb stalks of grass very well. So instead, what happens is the grass becomes, over the winter, becomes white, and that it's oxidized, so the carbon is going back in the air. Mm -hmm. And instead, we need something to put that, that, that uh, grass and uh, on those, uh, all those plants down on the soil where the bacteria can convert it and, and sequester it. And as uh, was said, we need that, that fungi, those mycorrhizae, to then grab that carbon and tie it up. Mm -hmm. Then we have a successful carbon sequestration program. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, we fed cattle at the same time. Right. But right now the federal program is designed to uh, provide the farmer with a payment for that land, but that only. If he would decide to graze it or something, he can do that, but then it costs him in a payment loss. And so there isn't any incentive to do that. Right. So, so it, it, it sounds like the, the deck is stacked, of course, that, that the federal incentives are, are against this program. So how, how can, um, I mean, you know, we're here in Washington. Does, does policy have to change on the federal level? Or can, or can this idea spread in, 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 a, in a way without having to change policy? Uh, I think policy would be the easy way to change it, uh, although I'm not experienced at changing policy. So. <laughs> <laughs> Most people in this town aren't either, yeah. actually. Yeah. <laughs> but we need more of an awareness of what is going on in that soil and, and the need to have a live soil. Yeah. And, and, that's, and, and understand that at the University of Nebraska, it was part of a research project trying to identify how much carbon could be sequestered in a corn bean versus a corn corn rotation. Mm -hmm. under irrigation and under dry land. And in every case, uh, at the end of the growing season, they had excess carbon in the soil. They had done mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. But by spring, it was all gone. Because yeah. they, they missed the mycorrhiza. They missed the soil part, the soil okay. bacteria, 
and fungi part, the roles that they play. Right. And so they lost it. Right. So we have, a, so we need to understand that, you know, yeah, the farmers need to know some of this, you know, these, these tricks and these, and, and this process knowledge, but so do the policy makers. Right. So, so, so let, let me ask the, the other two of you, what, what policies would you like to see? Uh, are, are there, a, there must be ideas for federal policies to help uh, folks go organic and to, and to spur the biochar uh, industry? I'll uh, start with uh, you, Jeff. Well, sure. I mean, I, we, we, have a, we have a farm bill in this country. What we really need is a food and soil bill. If we had a bill that we just simply changed the name and started concentrating on uh, producing food and protecting soil, or improving the health of soil, and stop worrying about subsidizing particular uh, entities that are benefiting from the system the way it is, I think that'd go a long way to changing things. Now, what are the chances of that? Well, you, you know as well as I do. But I think that's the kind of thing we have to start pushing. We also need to get more of the voting public interested in the kinds of systems we're talking about and supporting them. Uh, I think people in general underestimate the power of their own personal vote. We heard last night that some votes count more than others or are bigger than others, and I don't think that's true. I think some entities choose to exercise their vote more vigorously than other entities. Uh, simple things that, that happen in, uh, in Washington when, when people start emailing and calling their congressmen. Uh, and do it in mass, like what happened with the, uh, the, uh, the organic farm bill that we had, where, where you know, consumers, act when they wanted to change the organic standard, and consumers called uh, Washington in mass, four or 500,000 of them in, in a week's time, uh, Washington gets the message, and they go, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to leave it the way it is. Uh, so people do have power in their ability to vote with their food dollars to support a particular type of, of food system. Farmers need support. I mean, if you're not going to buy my product, uh, I'm not going to grow it. So we need to incentivize farmers by supporting the food and then also use that vote to push Congress uh, the way we want them to move. I think if you could somehow link organic farming to, uh, to uh, sh shutting down parts of the internet, you would have a huge outcry. If you remember what happened when there were some, uh, right. some bills recently. That's right. Um, mm -hmm. So jo Johannes, what, what federal policies would you like to see to help spur the, uh, the biochar industry? Um, I, I would like to see more uh, investment in, in adaptive research. Um, I, I see, uh, I think on the, on the fundamental research side, we, we can be successful or not. It depends on our, our ability to write grants and, and how smart the idea is. Um, but I, I, I see a, a lack in, in, uh, um, in supporting in, in various forms um, adaptive research, whether this is in, in the US or internationally, uh, where there's a distinct disconnect, um, uh, whether we, we either implement and support and subsidize um, or uh, we don't. But we, we don't bring the innovation to the farmer uh, in a way that the, the farmer uh, is in the, in the driver's seat of the, uh, of the innovation because I think 50% of the development needs to be done by the farmer. Um, but then very often we leave the researcher out um, and the researcher cannot uh, access that information or cannot help the farmer uh, to develop that information. Um, and, and I think that, uh, that's critical uh, to the success of, of any integrated and knowledge intensive uh, innovation. Right. With all three of you, we just have a few minutes left, but with all three of you, um, there's, uh, you know, a theme that, that's, that I'm hearing, which is that there's no giant, you know, conglomerate egg corporation that's going to benefit from any of this. Is there a way to yeah, make yeah. that? Right. Is, is that true? Yeah. It's true. Absolutely. No. It, that, it, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately. Well, I, I don't know that I agree with that. Uh, <laughs> you know, the systems we're talking about are scale neutral. We have some very, very large organic farms. Uh, I don't want to pick on anybody in particular, but you know, you look at somebody like Earthbound Farms. It's a, it's a conglomeration of farms. It's huge, 45,000 acres. I don't know. That's just a guess. I know they're giant. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily exclude people who have large, aspiration, large aspirations or large management potential. Uh, it all depends on how well you can manage the system. So I think the fact that it's scale neutral, the kinds of principles we're talking about uh, open the door wide to adoption across a broad spectrum. It's not for, you know, the cover crops are not for gardeners necessarily. Gardeners can use it. Uh, it's not for family-sized farms of, what, $250,000 uh, in, 
in, uh, in gross sales. Uh, it could be for a multi-million dollar operation. It doesn't really matter. It's, so I think that it is scale neutral and people of large farms could benefit just as well. As far, Ali, when you mentioned corporates, I was thinking of the inputs. Uh, the, corp the you know, corporate inputs are huge, and in a grazing system, there are few, if any, corporate right. inputs. So, right, right. But certainly the size... Is, is you're, not, you're not buying seed, you're not no, buying we're, fertilizer. We're just putting mm -hmm. livestock on, and, and actually the beauty of it is all we do is harvest. We do it in a managed way, in a timely way, but we harvest whatever's there, and then we harvest the animals too. So, I mean, that, well, they don't get any better than that. And, and the beef tastes good. And it tastes good, <laughs> and it's good for you, and everything else. <laughs> But yeah, but the timing is there. But, but I've seen operations of you know, uh, three thousand head uh, in in Nebraska mm -hmm. where they move them through the lives through the, the pastures. And actually, they the change they did is that they they uh, changed their calving period. Instead of doing it in the in the spring or winter, as it turns out in February, they moved it to May and June. And lo and behold, they didn't have any calving problems. The cows were better. The only problem was the cows gave too much milk. Because what they did, they were on grass that was green and growing and lush, and they had a really high nutritive diet because of that green grass, and so they were able to have the calf and then breed back within 60 days so they could again have a calf, you know, on their anniversary, and everything worked well. And the only difference was the farmer had much less to do. He didn't <laughs> make any hay anymore. He didn't use his his machinery for that because the cows were turned out into these into the winter grasses or the, the dormant grasses during the winter time without a calf. They don't need much nutri nutrition then. Yeah. And then they came back to the good grass in spring before they calved and voila, I mean. That sounds like a good selling point. Great, and when I was talking to this individual, he said, uh, he had a smile on his face and I said, what's so good about today? And he says, my third son said, I'm coming home to farm, Dad. So that's good. I can't think of a better way to end this, uh, this panel. <laughs> yeah, it's like you had that planned out. Um, <laughs> so thanks for, for, for making my job easy. I appreciate it. Uh, I learned a lot. And uh, you, know, I've, you know, my grandfather was a farmer, a uh, dairy farmer. And you know, I never once, I spent some time on his farm. And I never once stopped to think about the importance of the, of the soil and the health of the soil. So, so I thank you for, for, for bringing that, uh, for illuminating that topic. And uh, thanks for a great panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.